Hi, everyone. Before we get to today's episode, I just wanted to let you know that LCI has another podcast called the Faith Seeking Freedom Podcast. It's a little bit different from what you're used to. And because it's very different, we don't want to keep it in this podcast feed. So you can actually go subscribe to the Faith Seeking Freedom Podcast wherever you get your podcast. The Faith Seeking Freedom podcast is a podcast that is entirely question and answer. And because we've kept each episode short, we can actually release them more frequently. And you can actually listen to them in a shorter time frame. And you can even share them with friends or people that you want to spread the message of liberty. So check out and subscribe to the Faith Seeking Freedom podcast. Okay, back to the regular podcast. Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute. I am your host, Doug Stewart, and we are going to talk about the ethics of anarcho-capitalism with our guest, Chris Borer. He's an entrepreneur with a background in robotics, AI, and software engineering. He studied engineering at Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pennsylvania. And he is the author of a book, The Ethics of Anarcho-Capitalism, which is what we're going to talk about in this episode. Chris, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you. So I really liked your book, and I liked it for a number of reasons, one of which is it has a unique way of writing. It has a unique voice, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But I want to let our audience get to know you a little bit. Like, what's your background? How did you become a libertarian? Did you come out of the womb of, you know, an anarcho-capitalist? Or were you convinced <laughs> in some way? Did, you know, were you converted at a Ron Paul rally? What, what, what's your backstory, both, you know, career slash political journey? I grew up in sort of rural New Jersey, which was mainly Republican. So I guess I was Republican by association at birth. And then... In my college years, met up with some libertarian friends who started moving me in that direction. And uh, yeah, you guessed it. I ended up at a Ron Paul rally uh, one day in Philadelphia. And that's what really moved me in the direction of anarcho-capitalism. Oh, that's really cool. And that was literally a total guess. I had no idea that that was part <laughs> of your backstory. So that's <laughs> it's very similar. I didn't go to a Ron Paul rally, but it was Ron Paul for me as well mm-hmm. in a very important way. As you were sort of being drawn in by friends and and ideas, like what were some of the stronger attractions for you with respect to the message of liberty? I think at the time I was kind of interested in economics and how Mm -hmm. libertarianism could make the world healthier and wealthier and happier. And then, you know, as you get deeper and deeper, you find out that there are so many other great things that happen when people live peacefully together. Mm. And to bring it back to Dr. Ron Paul, I just really liked how honest and consistent he was. It was kind of refreshing and I loved that. So it was a good place to be. Yeah, for sure. That feels like another lifetime ago considering what we're kind of dealing with in our present day. True, true. So what about your career? So you're not like a career politician or a career libertarian in sort of those (laughs) fields. It looks like you're into entrepreneurship and all kinds of engineering things. So tell us a little bit about what you do there as much as you care to share. I guess I'm mainly a technology guy. I started out more in the hardware space, building robots and things like that. Back in my academic days, I built things like snake robots for search and rescue applications. Uh, I worked in a company that built robotic key copying kiosks for a while. But lately, I've been doing a lot of software engineering. Mm. So kind of all over the place, but any kind of tech is fine by me. Yeah, that's really cool, man. So the book, The Ethics of Anarcho-Capitalism, it's a pretty decent sized book, but it's not like, you know, it's not like the length of human action, mm. but it's a major accomplishment to write a book the way that you did. So where did the idea for the book begin in you and kind of when did it begin and how? And, you know, it tells a little bit of the, the origin story there. Like many budding libertarians, I went through a phase where I was reading a lot and listening to podcasts and just trying to learn as much as I could. And I guess as an engineer, I, want, I really wanted to understand how libertarianism works. And after reading a lot, I kind of suspected that there was a problem with the way that libertarianism was defined. And the reason was because we'd occasionally run into hypothetical scenarios that libertarianism would have a hard time answering you know, the mm-hmm. way it was defined. So I wanted to find out, you know, is there something wrong with libertarianism or are we just not thinking about it in the right way? 
And so the book was kind of a quest to answer that question for myself. I keep mentioning this unique voice that you've written it in. So I think it would be safe to say you're writing this in the second person, if I'm getting that right. That's right. And the reader is the main character in this story that Mm -hmm. is an exploration from, I guess you could put it, from island to city in a very, like, I don't know. It's sort of like when Norman told me about it, because, you know, he introduced me to the book and for us to have this interview, he explained this to me. And I was like, oh, that that sounds like a book that a libertarian would write. (laughs) 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 But as I got into it, you really are wrestling with things in the way that I wrestled with the non-aggression principle and where does it apply? How does it apply? How can Mm -hmm. we misapply it? Which we'll talk about here in a little bit, I think. And so that unique voice is something that I think helps the reader like see it in a way that is personal and a way that helps them see that the thought process can be theirs. So I don't know if that's exactly what you were going for or just a portion of it. I do kind of wonder, and this is actually something Norman was talking to me about, is there something different what you're trying to do here versus what other fiction writers in the past, and when I say fiction, sorry, I should say like narrative, nonfiction storytellers in the past would like to do, or even people like Ayn Rand. What is it that you're trying to accomplish by writing it in this unique style? Well, you mentioned being personal, which I think was very important to me. Many people think of libertarianism in terms of politics or political systems, but Mm -hmm. I really think libertarianism is more of an ethical system, which is something that applies to everyone, even in their day-to-day lives. So I wanted to make that clear that this is something, a tool people can use and something that can be interesting and fun, no matter what their occupation is. But in terms of how it relates to other libertarian works, fiction or otherwise, I was really not trying to persuade people to be libertarian. Hmm. My main goal was to just explain what it is and lay it out there. And if people think it's interesting or want to adopt it as their ethical system, then great. I would find that to be wonderful. But I didn't want to distract from the main mission by trying to say you know, why people might want to be libertarian. And I think many of the fiction works and other works are more inspirational. And they talk about how wonderful life could be if you know, everyone were libertarian or all the great benefits to the Mm. economy or people's personal lives. And, you know, I touch on it, but I didn't want it to be the focus of the book. Yeah, there are characters in the book who are very much in favor and excited about the prospects of capitalism and and a libertarian society, but that's not the core of what you're doing, for sure. Right. So one thing that you are is you've been in like software engineering and even like robotics and things like that. And Do you think that that training as an engineer helped in your writing? If so, I think there might be a lot of young engineers out there and aspiring writing engineers who might want to delve into the area of economics and ethics. So like, is there any intersection for you about like your strength in writing this and your ability to write what you've written? I think it definitely helps when your job every day is, you know, looking at complex systems and trying to figure out the rules by which they work, you can kind of apply that to ethical systems and moral systems Mm -hmm. and things like that. And I would love for more technically interested people to be involved in economics and ethics because bringing a diversity of skill sets into the field can only help us. You know, they'll take unique perspectives on different issues and there are many areas that haven't been explored yet. So I would highly encourage anyone who's interested to to get involved. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So... I kind of mentioned already that like most libertarians would, you know, kind of get the premise of your book starting on an island. It's very sort of Robin Mm Crusoe-esque. Can you unpack a little bit like what motivated you to take this approach rather than like starting with this bad situation already in place, like a bad state, as it were? Like, um, I mean, you could have started this book in any particular way, but is there a particular reason why you started it on an island in sort of a Robinson Crusoe sort of way? Yeah, it was it was actually necessary because ethical situations can get very complicated very fast. The real world is very messy. And that's why we have courts and juries and things like that. Because mm-hmm. when you have a real conflict in the real world, there are thousands of different factors. You know, so there's even like a simple thing like a car crash. Well, was the road slippery or was the weather bad? Was somebody texting on their phone? There's so many different factors to consider and they can really distract from the fundamental principles that you're trying to apply uh, libertarianism to. So when you strip all of that away, or as much as you can, you're ended up with a pile of sand, a couple of people interacting, and 
that's where they really get started with the basics. Yeah. Okay. Well, and and I kind of felt that too, as I was able to re-engage some of the core thought of libertarianism. I mean, you become a libertarian and like 15 years later, it just, it sort of sifts in the back as your foundation. Mm -hmm. Not to make the illusion that it's Sandy Foundation, but (laughs) (laughs) but there's this like, it's just back there and you're like, oh yeah, that's right. That is how the non-aggression principle actually functions in these situations. And what Mm -hmm. I loved about the way in which you wrestle with the conflicts that continue to arise or the potential conflicts, I should say, is how you actually take a page or two or whatever it might be and analyze what what makes this a conflict or not and what situations could it be that like make this not an actual conflict. And so like you have to wrestle through what, what is applicable and the praxeology and the motivations of people themselves. So let's actually jump into the book itself a little bit. I don't know if you want to sort of start off with the basic, like here's, I'm going to say the main character because the main character is me and it's everybody who's reading this book. So I don't know how you want to (laughs) word that, but like, anyway, start us off with where the book is and sort of the initial problems. And then we can kind of talk through some of it as we, as we go through We won't do too many spoilers, of course, because that's actually important to, to keep for the readers. Yeah. We start off with one person on the Island and, it's kind of boring from an ethical perspective because they're all alone and so there can't be any conflict. But there are other things to contend with. You know, it's not fun being on an island, so trying to figure out how to survive. And then slowly we introduce more characters to make the ethical scenarios more complicated. And you can get pretty far with two people, but to really understand libertarianism, you really need three. So eventually you get to a point where there's a little small community trying to survive on this island. And obviously... The challenges that arise lead to, you know, some friction. We'll say, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I don't know if you want to go into maybe some examples of those initial kinds of conflict as sort of an illustration for how is it that this actually clarifies, like you said earlier, like it clarifies and and sort of doesn't distract from all the the variations in ethics that we see in our modern day. Sure. So when you're on a a desert island, one of the very simple things that you're dealing with is food. So the characters harvest coconuts and, you know, there can be conflict over a simple thing like a coconut. You know, who gets to eat it? Who's in charge of different piles of coconuts? And, you know, when someone trades a coconut or steals a coconut, how do you resolve that from a libertarian perspective? And, um, you know, if it were in the modern world, things might be a little more complicated because, I don't know, you might be in California and someone has legalized petty theft and then you know breaking into a store and taking things is you know more of a gray area but on island it's just you and some other people and it's pretty clear who picked the coconut from the tree so it makes it a little easier to understand yeah i mean the coconut becomes sort of the first capital because it's the first thing that can be accumulated mm. if i'm remembering all the details from the very beginning right that the coconut is what becomes sort of the object of potential conflict in a way because everybody wants something that you can't get super easily. So it's like the first scarcity item, right? Right. And the praxeology aspect of it, I think I want to have you talk about that a little bit, because that's like probably the most helpful thing for me to re-engage as I was reading it, was that the difference between just observing someone's behavior versus knowing their motivations or figuring out what their motivations and objectives are for their behavior... You know, you could see one person taking a coconut from the pile of another person. But if you don't know that they were given permission to do that, or if you don't know that they were given permission to borrow it with maybe interest or something like that, like you could be witnessing something completely different. So how did praxeology inform the way in which you spelled out and sort of fleshed out, I should say, the way to understand the non-aggression principle? Uh, It's really the most appropriate tool for analyzing ethical situations. And earlier you talked about how libertarianism can kind of sit in the back of your mind and people understand it implicitly. And you can be a very good libertarian with an implicit understanding of libertarianism and you can kind of feel what's a good situation when Mm -hmm. when you're doing the right thing. But when you want to spell it out explicitly, you need something a little more sophisticated and, and praxeology gives you that. So, you know, praxeology is all about purposeful behavior emphasis on the purposeful. Mm -hmm. And so you have to understand not just what 
people are physically doing, but what they're thinking as well. And just like you said, once you understand that, you can be a little more cautious about jumping to conclusions about what's going on in a certain situation. Is somebody you know, trying to steal my car or are they just looking around or you know, checking their hair in the mirror or something? Uh, you don't really know until you do a little more investigation. And um, like you said, with coconuts, even something so simple as you know, picking a coconut off the ground can be a potential conflict or not, depending on the circumstances. Yeah, it reminded me of the training I did when I worked at a previous job. This would have been, gosh, now 16 years ago, where we had to do what was called assume positive intent. And you had to sort of like mentally go through the explanations for something that could have been bad behavior Mm. that would have made it like, oh, actually, that was positive behavior rather than like bad behavior or whatever. And so the way in which you sort of like the main character... I guess I should say the way I in the book <laughs> um, <laughs> was was contemplating and thinking through people is like it felt very familiar to me. And you know, honestly, I think in certain ways that's a really good thing to do generally. You're right. But you're right; it's really important with with praxeology because you know the same physical behavior might be different depending on you know some of the mental components. One thing that I really enjoyed understanding about the importance of the non-aggression principle is that. It is a better foundation to libertarianism and to ethics than simply property rights because sometimes we get that confused because these kind of things all get kind of bundled together in our defense mm-hmm. of a libertarian society. Like, oh, well, we know we need strong property rights and value of non-aggression principle. Like they kind of get bundled together. Right. And one thing that I really appreciated was you saying that the non-aggression principle is really the best way to sort of see through what property is doing on behalf of the individual. If I'm saying that all correctly in, in your mind, you can correct me and say it better. But I think what you said is like what approximates the non-aggression principle closest is what is the best form of justice or is the best way to achieve justice and I guess you could say peace you know, to avoid conflict. So I don't know if you want to comment a little bit more on that, like why property rights isn't quite enough. Sure. And I, th- I think this is a little controversial. There are many great libertarians who think that the property system and property rights should be the foundation of libertarianism. Mm-hmm. There are many great libertarians who think that the non-aggression principles should be. Some even say things like contract law should be the basis. So I don't want to say it's definitely the non-aggression principle. It's just my opinion. Mm-hmm. But in, in my view, the non-aggression principle gives you the most precise analysis of any ethical situation, but it's also most difficult to use. And then the property system is much easier to use, gives you sort of a more rudimentary look at what's going on in a particular situation. The property system is better in most day-to-day situations because it's easy. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do deep thinking to resolve conflicts. You can just say, hey, this is my bicycle. I'm going to go ride it or give it back. But if you try to build an ethical system off of the property system, you're going to run into problems because people who are against libertarianism or in favor of some other ethical system will be able to construct scenarios where the property system fails or at least fails to lead to a libertarian conclusion. Mm. And if they can do that, they can kind of just laugh and say, you know, libertarianism is inconsistent. We shouldn't pay attention to it. You know, setting aside that all the other systems are way more inconsistent. <laughs> but I think we have higher standards for ourselves yeah. as libertarians than uh, yeah, yeah. most others. Yeah, well, and I think that this idea of property rights, like it is an easy proxy for non-aggression because if you, you know, I think most people have this assumption that like, okay, believe in property rights and even those who are like property rights absolutists would say like, I can do whatever I want with my property. The problem is, in a way, they can't because there is sort of a limit to that and the non-aggression principle mm-hmm. is the reason that there is that limit. Like it, it actually is the undergirded, like it undergirds property rights as an ethical good. That's exactly that right. Sense? Am, I, am I saying it that right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Anytime the property system fails to lead to a libertarian conclusion, we know that, you know, most people will feel that implicitly. They'll understand like something's not quite right about this situation. Mm-hmm. It's my bat, but maybe I can't hit people with it. That feels wrong. But the, the rationale and reasoning comes from the non-aggression principle. And sometimes you have to fall back onto the more fundamental rule of the non-aggression principle to understand why that is. So you would say that like my, so I have a bat and you have a vehicle, okay? And I have a bat, it's my property, you have a vehicle, it's your property. And I don't have a right 
to damage your vehicle, not because it's your property, but because of the non-aggression principle. Right. And like the ethical core is not just because it's your property. It's because the non-aggression principle is true. Am I getting that correct? Or is that... (laughs) I don't want to say the non-aggression principle is true. The non-aggression principle is something you can adopt as your ethical system. And so as libertarians, we hold it to be the correct rule for resolving conflict. But yeah, I think even multiple pieces of property can be kind of confusing. Walter Block has a good paper on this where he's he called the human body shield, where you can just use people to kind of resolve it. So if you know there's a bad guy and he's holding somebody hostage and you can stop him, but you'd have to shoot through the hostage, is that okay? And we have this idea of property where you own your own body. So you know, is it okay for somebody to stop the bad guy by shooting through a hostage, even though the hostage owns, you know, owns their body? And there's really no good re- way to resolve that situation using property rules. Because oh. if you're an absolutist, like you said, then you can't shoot the hostage. But then the criminal has this kind of unstoppable armor where he can go into any bank or wherever he wants and do whatever he wants because you're not allowed to hurt this innocent person. Mm. Mm. We've got to kind of fall back on that Christian principle and say, if I shoot the hostage to stop the bad guy, you know, there's certainly a conflict. But who's causing the conflict? It's not the innocent hostage, but it's, it's not me either. <laughs> yeah. It's really this you know, bad guy who's taking a hostage and doing other bad things to kind of provoke the response. Mm-hmm. So that's just an example of where the property system isn't quite high enough resolution to solve every problem. Mm, that's a good way to put it, the resolution analogy there. So I don't need you to pick fights with other libertarians per se here, but like, are there other ways in which the concept of property you feel is misapplied in the libertarian world? And I use the word libertarian pretty broadly there, so I don't need you to like narrow it too much. Probably the most obvious is the libertarians who favor intellectual property. I think that's mm. a pretty gross misapplication of the property system and the non-aggression principle. And there are probably other examples, but none really come to mind. Yeah. Hey, everyone. If you're like me, you listen to a lot of podcasts by producers and creators who have a listener support model. Sometimes people call it the Patreon model, where they ask listeners to give them money to keep the podcast going because they want a list of supporters. And there's certain benefits to doing that. They offer you know, free episodes ahead of time or bonus content and so forth. LCI has taken a different approach because we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We operate solely on the donations of those who are generous and love what we do. Now, we are totally appreciative of the fact that we have a growing audience and everybody's sharing our content. But if you'd like to be one of the people who donate to the Libertarian Christian Institute because we're a nonprofit, it's actually tax deductible. You can do that at libertarianchristians.com slash donate. You can donate in a number of ways, some of which incur fees for us and some of which do not. And you can either choose to pay those fees or not. However you want to do it, any small amount actually helps. We actually do encourage people to sign up for some sort of monthly contribution. So that gives us a better sense of how things are going to go each month through the year. So even if it's as little as five, 10 bucks a month, that really helps us a lot. You know, that really adds up when more and more people do it. So we appreciate all of your support, whether it's sharing, liking, reviewing, and doing all that. But we, of course, appreciate an actual financial donation to the Libertarian Christian Institute. So what's your typical response to libertarians or those who claim to be libertarians who, you know, believe in strong property rights for intellectual things? (laughs) I will have to say, you are the first person that I have seen. Okay, I'm I'm gonna, this isn't really a spoiler. I'm just gonna say that like the example you use in the book is is a recipe. And I'm just like, Why have I not heard? I don't think I've ever heard Stefan Kinsella. I don't think I've ever read any (laughs) other anti-IP person use a recipe as an example for like how absurd somebody getting a copyright for a recipe would be in our world. But Mm -hmm. you didn't go into that. But you you like used a recipe as the base example of like how stupid this idea is. (laughs) Like it's just knowledge. So anyway, I I was really enjoying that quite a bit. I was like, yes, somebody else is saying it. So anyway, tell me your analysis of intellectual property and why the non-aggression principle, well, how it relates to actual or non-actual property rights. First, I'm going to try to extend an olive branch to the libertarians who like IP. You can still be libertarian (laughs) even if you're not 100% in line with 
anarcho-capitalism or my flavor of anarcho-capitalism. Uh, it's a big tent and it's okay. They'll get there. But in terms of the actual question of intellectual property, it's really just a question of applying the non-aggression principle. You know, there are two steps or two steps that I like to use. The first is, is there a conflict? And then if there is a conflict, whose fault is it or who caused the conflict? And with intellectual property, I mean, there is no conflict because like you said, one person can use a recipe to cook dinner and someone else on the other side of the world can use a recipe to cook the same recipe. And it doesn't interfere with either of them. And sometimes in the modern world, a conflict arises when an IP advocate says, hey, you're using my recipe, then goes and tries to stop somebody from using it because they feel like they own it. But when you think about it, that new conflict that does exist was caused by the person who's trying to enforce intellectual property rights, not by the person who's just cooking dinner. So, and and we don't have to dwell on this particular one, but to give deference to the the libertarians I threw under the bus in my introduction to this comment uh, or to this little <laughs> segment was, <laughs> it seems to me that like the biggest argument in favor of some minimal sense of IP is the idea that like, it's not just that I can't cook that recipe or, or whatever. It's more like I'm using that as the basis for an income and I'm using that. And, and sure, maybe I'm on the other side of the world and, or I'm on the other side of the country or even, you know, somewhere that's not even in actual competition with you. But like, if I do something, I, I worked really hard at creating this masterful, and again, we'll just stick on recipes here, this masterful creation of a meal. And I keep that private and somehow it gets out and somebody else uses it. And they do it too. And they use it to sell meals to people in, in their restaurant or whatever without any effort whatsoever. It does seem like there's a conflict, but I'm venturing to say that you would say there is no conflict. So why is there no conflict even though there is maybe a lot of discomfort? So to directly answer your question, there's no conflict because the way I define conflict is when multiple people are engaging in human action that is mutually exclusive. So mm. when you just, the two things can't happen. So, you know, two people can't eat the same piece of fruit. They can't sit in the same chair. Those are, you know, just impossibilities. But two people can cook the same food. Two people can try to sell the same meal, cook from the same recipe to the same market. And just because they both can't win at selling doesn't mean they both can't try. So mm. you've got to take a step back and say, you know, who is preventing who from doing what in the situation? You know, my trying to sell something that I made doesn't necessarily prevent you from trying to do the same thing. Yeah. But I wanted to mention that many libertarians come to the conclusion that IP is legitimate for economic reasons. Libertarians are very into economics generally. They like things that improve economic efficiency, Austrian economics, all this. But there are many areas of politics and ethics and society where this economic argument leads to a bad ethical conclusion. IP is one of them, but there are people that you know, support war, for instance, because they think that the money that the government spends on the military industrial complex is good for the economy. <laughs> right. And yeah. you can say, hey, why don't, why don't we just, you know, take those ships, take our own ships and blow them up in the ocean and sink them. And then we'll rebuild them and <laughs> we'll spend even more on the military industrial complex and then they get mad. So I, I think people should just be cautious about this idea of trying to come to ethical conclusions from an economic or financial yeah. standpoint. Wow, you have a really big tent for libertarians if those people are on your list. <laughs> that's a, that's <laughs> a stretch for me, man. <laughs> they're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. The, the somewhere, orientation right? is probably where, where it needs to start. I want to talk a little yeah. bit about justice. The key thing that I took away from this is this idea that restoration, and that's an important thing for a lot of Christians, that there's this theology around it. There's a whole tradition, the Anabaptist tradition, which is all about reconciliation and restoration part of the narrative of, you know, the good news in the Christian faith is that there is going to be a restoration happen to creation through, through the work of Christ. And so it resonated with me that there is this idea in this ethics of anarcho-capitalism that isn't just about retribution for wrongs being done. Mm -hmm. And you can give an example from maybe the book or whatever, but it seemed really important to you as I was reading 
that you go through and say, look, this isn't just about so and so, you know, hit somebody. They need to get hit back to teach them a lesson or to sort of just make the other person feel good that the person got hit back or something like that. It's more like, okay, if there was damage done, like sometimes you can't undo the damage. Death would be one example. But Mm -hmm. you have to approximate, and we're going to use that word again, approximate what would things be like and how would it be restored if this hadn't happened at all. Because not everything is undoable. Like You can return the the coconut, right? If it's unharmed, it's completely like... You know, you got caught red-handed and nothing would happen to it. Okay, I'll give it back, right? Mm-hmm. But there's more to it than just giving that back. I mean, that technically isn't the only part of the conflict. So anyway, I, I can let you start in that part of the discussion a little bit as, as you wish, but you know, talk a little bit about that importance. Yeah, it was um, something I wasn't really expecting and just kind of came out of the narrative. But the idea that when somebody engages in aggression and causes conflict, they've changed the trajectory of somebody's life and in a way that is not good. So if you are somebody who's trying to be a law enforcement person or a judge, you know, part of your role is not just to make sure that person doesn't do it again, but also to try and bring the world back to as close to as what it would have been if the evil event had never happened. So this is important for people who are trying to work in a criminal justice system, even in a libertarian society, you would have police and courts and they would be trying to you know, move the world back towards what it would have been if you know aggression had not happened. But it's also important for people who, even libertarians, you know, living their lives will occasionally be aggressors. You know, mistakes happen. You might step on somebody's foot, or uh, who knows, like accidentally bump somebody's car with your car and dent it. And this idea that <laughs> you might not be able to completely fix the problem, but you should want to, as a libertarian, make it up to the person or get back. You know, get the world as close to as what it would have been if that had never happened. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that's all justice is from an ethical perspective, in my opinion, is this idea of just undoing the consequences of conflict. Yeah. And again, this is one particular area where it illustrates your strength. And I'll say it this way, in a lot of places in the book, some people could see it as belaboring something not needed. But as I went through it, I mean, this is like, okay, an additional page worth of contemplating this ethical scenario. Because I mean, the book is about contemplating ethicals, (laughs) right? Yeah, Ethicals, I don't know if that's a word. But it illustrates that like, it's really worth thinking about. Like, this isn't just about restoring, you know, giving the thing back. But it's Mm -hmm. now that you've also disrupted trust, even if it's just clumsiness, right? Like, it could be clumsiness, like it's funny that you use denting someone's car. It literally happened to me today before we recorded this. And it's like, oh. oh, okay. So now there's like the person was clumsy and they backed into me. And it's like, okay, there was no, you know, there was no aggression, right? But there was conflict and there was you know, no malice, I should say. And so there's gonna be a whole process now. And it actually affects my life in more than just my vehicle was damaged, right? Mm-hmm. And so it could be, you know, a friendship's trust. You know, that takes a long time to restore back as well. So I really appreciated that in particular. I mean, there's a handful of things that stood out to me. And every book, you know, if I read it again, which I probably will do, will stand out to me in different ways. And I think that those are key stories. And I'm going to use that word stories because you're telling this from a story perspective that kind of resonated with me. So I appreciate a lot of those things in, in, in how you wrote it. Thanks. So. The progression of the book is not just, we're not going to stay on an island. And what we also don't have to do is spoil sort of where the ending goes, right? But there is a more advanced society that I end up on. And so the mechanism for telling this story in that way is quite interesting because you have to jump from these, at least I think, and maybe you can speak to this, it seems to me that you have to jump from, okay, I've got a three-person society, now we have to witness and experience more than just three people, like several thousand or whatever the size of this advanced society is. Was that kind of what you were going for? Like we had to come from small island to applying these in a broader level? Am I getting that correct? I think every libertarian has an experience where they talk about the principles of libertarianism and then someone says, yeah, but could it work, right? Could you have a country Mm. that's a libertarian country? Could it scale, scale, yeah. So I did think it was important to address that a little bit. I didn't want it to be the focus of the book, but 
I think people, it's hard to internalize how an ethical system can impact you and your life and the lives of those around you if, if you don't take it to that next level. Yeah, no, that's, that's really true. I like that it went in that direction because there was a point at which I'm like, I, we need to get off this island. <laughs> <laughs> that's not to put down any, anything in your writing whatsoever. It was just more like, okay, I've contemplated what I need to contemplate on this island and I'm going to get on this, off this island. And so, so I do. <laughs> I like talking about this as if I'm the main character. Um, <laughs> it works well for people who like to talk about themselves. So I do want to ask if you're okay with me asking you this. Is there a reason that cryptocurrency is not something that's part of the story? Oh, well, obviously I'm in favor of crypto. And I think it would be... I was very tempted to make it like the currency of the more advanced society that you mentioned. I thought it just might be a little distracting from the, the core ethical message. Mm. You know, crypto is great. And I think it may have been more exciting, actually, to many people to have a book with crypto in it. I could probably put mm. in the title and sell more some more copies. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't I didn't want to get hung up on any particular implementation of a libertarian society. You know, technologies change over time and I just wanted to focus so on the like too specifically predictive of what it should look like. Yeah, and it's also a controversial topic. You know, there are different cryptocurrencies mm-hmm. and different views about how the future is gonna evolve and yeah. So I, I didn't yeah, want to no, be predictive that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fine. I didn't see it as a deficiency. And I, honestly, I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me until I was sitting down to write notes about this conversation that we're having. It didn't even, so it, the absence of, I just ruined it for everybody, I think, is I just talked about the absence of it and they're going to be like, what? I didn't talk about it? But no, it's, it doesn't distract <laughs> at all. You might be right. And now that you, you know, sort of gave your reasons for it, it's like, oh, yeah, okay. I can see it as a distraction from sort of the core point that's going on. So how has the um, book been received? I mean, like what's been your, your interaction with people who have read it? You know, you've heard my thoughts. I'm sure you've had, you've been on some other podcasts with people that I know. What's been the average reader response? Uh, it's been very polarizing. I think some people like it a lot and some people hate it. And uh, I actually did a post on my blog about one star reviews that I got yeah, on I Amazon that. and other places. <laughs> But I think most of the haters are not very serious. And I was actually a little disappointed because I had intended to do a revision of the book after one year of publishing it and just doing updates from all the criticism and you know other negative feedback that I got. Mm. And there really wasn't anything interesting. Some people helpfully said, you know, some terms might have been confusing or you know, gave suggestions on how to potentially improve the ways of explaining things. But there were no serious attacks that I felt like I had to go back and address. There wasn't anything substantial, at least in the ones that I saw the, of that article you were mentioning, there wasn't any that were like really substantial critiques. Like you probably got better right. critiques from actual libertarians in sort of your first draft phase, right? Yeah. If there's one thing you can count on libertarians for, it's critiques of libertarian theory. So the ethics of anarcho-capitalism where can people buy it? Where do you prefer that they buy it? Because I know that sometimes that matters. And where can people find you online? They can find me at chrisborer.com. It's available on Amazon and Audible. Some people don't like those platforms. So if you just contact me, I'll send you a copy. Excellent. Well, is there anything else you'd like to share about the book with our audience? It comes highly recommended by me, as everybody's already heard. But Chris, if you want to say anything more, is another chance. Uh, no, I just hope people enjoy it. And if not, uh, send me a note and let me know why. Okay, and maybe you'll get an actual substantive one-star review so that you can (laughs) make that second version, right? (laughs) I look forward to it. All right, thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. Thank you.